Affordable Housing Association of Indiana Executive Director, and we're happy to part with ICBA today for their INSPIRE training. Um, I wanted to let you know about some upcoming trainings that we're hosting. We offer free monthly one-hour fireside chat webinars for industry-related topics. Our next one is this coming Tuesday, April 23rd, and that's covering lease violations and terminating a lease presented by local attorney, Jay Beatty. We're also hosting a live presentation on June 12th covering HATMA, which will be presented by Steve Rosenblatt with Spectrum. Details on all of this can be found on our website, which is INAHA. Dot org. And you can feel free to contact me if you have any more questions. Thanks, Matt. All right, perfect. Well, thank you, Amanda. Uh, we appreciate the partnership with the Affordable Housing Association. Um, and yeah, with Amanda's new leadership and, and working to get a lot of trainings going back on, uh, we think some great opportunities coming up for partners. So uh, today is kind of re kicking off the IHCDA AHANE joint uh, webinar series. And uh, for those of you who aren't aware, our next one in this series uh, will be a free HOTMA training we have coming up in May, I believe May 6th, I want to say that is out on our official notices uh, with the with the link to join. So we hope to see a lot of you at that as well. Uh, but without further ado, we'll go ahead and jump into today's session. We have a lot of uh, content to cover today uh, with the topic of Inspire. So uh, Amanda, if you could just confirm that uh, you are seeing the slides and that they are moving forward. Yes, they are. All right, excellent, thank you. All right, um, so our agenda for today is to really hit uh, this will be somewhat high level, but we'll get into the weeds on a few kind of topics of interest. Uh, and the goal is really to leave everyone with a good understanding of what is Inspire, what are these new changes that we're dealing with as it relates to the physical inspections uh, that are happening on a, a number of our affordable housing uh, projects and programs. Uh, so we'll start uh, high level with really looking at uh, what is Inspire? Uh, from there, we will talk about the applicability of Inspire. So which programs is this affecting? And we'll talk about the timing. So when do these changes go into effect? For many programs, the answer is it already is effect in effect, but we'll talk about those that are still coming up. Where we will start with the applicability and timing is looking at what do the federal guidance tell us, right? We know we have a number of friends on the call today who are joining from other states that are just interested in this topic and great to have them with us. Uh, but then after we go through the national, we will cover just a couple of slides going back specific then to what does implementation look like in Indiana. But most of the content today will be widely applicable for, for properties or programs across the country. Uh, we'll then to hit a highlight on what do we know right now? What has HUD given us on guidance about Inspire and where can you find that HUD guidance material? Uh, and then we'll really dig into the meat of the presentation, right? So looking at what is the focus of Inspire? What is it meant to do? Uh, what are the inspectable areas under Inspire? And specifically, what are these new things called affirmatively affirmative habitability requirements? These are the minimum things that must be in place in the inside of our buildings, the outside and uh, within units. Uh, we'll talk about severity levels. So when an Inspire inspection happens, how is each issue ranked on severity and what does that mean for the correction period? Uh, look at a little bit about what life-threatening conditions exist, talk overall about what are the standards under Inspire, and then we'll focus today on uh, looking at a few of the standards that we are already seeing through our first quarter of inspecting uh, as being the most common violations. And then we'll end with a variety of kind of miscellaneous notes, reminders, and, and recommended next steps. So lots of content today. Uh, excited to be here providing this material. All right, so as we start off, though, we want to start with a quick disclaimer, uh, and the disclaimer is really that Inspire is an evolving topic, right? This is, we just started getting Inspire information, final information last summer, fall. Um, there is still expected or, or known HUD guidance coming on some areas where we don't have final answers. Uh, so our material today should be viewed as being subject to change with pending HUD guidance. Uh, it's not official legal guidance, uh, and nor is this a comprehensive training. We can't cover everything Inspire in the next hour. We're not going to certainly not going to walk through all 63 of the standards in detail. We'll highlight a few of the, the common violations we've seen. Um, and, and, and importantly, we're not going to today go into the weeds 
reads on the scoring system. What's important to know with Inspire is that if you were a project that pre-Inspire would have been scored, so our public housing HUD multifamily world where you're assigned a score after an inspection, you will continue to be scored under Inspire, but the scoring system is, is going to be somewhat changed, okay? We don't have time today to go in the details of how scoring is going to work. What's important though is if prior to Inspire you were not getting a score, you were getting an inspection with issues to fix but not a numerical score assigned, you still will not be getting a score, right? So in the low income housing tax credit world, home housing trust fund, our voucher programs, you still will not be assigned a score, okay? So those of you who live in HUD multifamily world, public housing world, it will be important for you to seek out additional information on how Inspire scoring works. Uh, there is what's called the Inspire scoring notice that is on HUD's website website uh, and you'll see that listed later when we talk about uh, the various HUD materials out there. All right, so with the disclaimers behind us, we'll jump right in then uh, to what is INSPIRE. Uh, so INSPIRE, we'll continue using the acronym throughout the training today, uh, but INSPIRE stands for the National Standards for the Physical Inspection of Real Estate. Uh, and at its core, what INSPIRE is, it is, it is the newly released uh, HUD inspection standard and scoring system, right? So this is the system that we are now using to conduct inspections, to identify what are and are not issues. If there is an issue, how long you have to correct it and how you correct it. And then if you are in a scored program to understand how the scoring works, this is all covered by the Inspire standards. At its core, what Inspire really does is to say prior to now, prior to Inspire going into effect, we were in a world where in our affordable housing universe, different standards were being applied. So some programs were using UPCS, the Uniform Physical Condition Standards. Some were using HQS, the Housing Quality Standards. There was some similarity between those, but certainly differences. And so the goal of Inspire is to say, let's throw those together, take the best of them, leave out what we don't like anymore, and come to one unified inspection standard, which is now Inspire, right? So the goal is really standardization, standardization and consistency across uh, the variety of affordable housing programs out there, with one exception that we'll talk about in a moment, okay? So let's look then here at the applicability, right? Who is affected by Inspire? And let's start talking about the timing. Uh, what we do know for sure, right, is that uh, definitely Inspire applies in HUD world, right? So it applies to really all three primary housing divisions of HUD. Uh, so we have HUD multifamily, that is HUD programs like project-based Section 8, uh, 811, 202, et cetera, those project-based rental assistance programs uh, with, that we think of as kind of the HUD handbook programs. Uh, this also covers public and Indian housing. That is the voucher programs and our public housing programs. And then this also covers HUD CPD, Community Planning and Development, which is the Home National Housing Trust Fund, Community Development Block Grants, those kind of grant programs uh, within HUD. So all three of the big housing divisions of HUD are adopting Inspire. And as we'll see in a moment, while we don't necessarily have anything directly from the IRS yet that, it, that talks about Inspire, we can infer by reading the regulations uh, and as we've seen states adopting, uh, that the answer is the reality is Inspire is going to apply to the tax credit program as well. Again, we'll look at it the reg in a moment to explain why that's the case. Now, I said there was an exception, right? The goal of Inspire is to unify one standard to rule them all, right? But we do have one kind of glaring exception here, and that is that there is no indication that uh, USDA Rural Development intends to adopt Inspire. And I know a number of you in the AHAIN network uh, are involved with the RD program, uh, but the reality is even prior to Inspire, RD was kind of its own thing. It, it was not using full UPCS standards like we were using on tax credits, home, et cetera. It was not using HQS. It kind of had its own thing before. Uh, and what we up what appears to be the case, you know, more guidance to come is that RD has decided that uh, 2024 and going forward, it is instead of adopting to HUD world, it's going to align itself uh, with a set of inspection standards that are set by the Mortgage Bankers Association. Uh, I am not versed in these inspection standards at all, so I really can't answer questions about that today. This is just kind of something we've recently come to understand is that this seems to be the model that, that RD is going to be aligning to. So most of our affordable housing programs will now be unified under Inspire, RD appears to be the outlier, okay? Now, for a lot of the programs, Inspire has already gone into effect. Uh, for public housing, public housing was the first adopter back in July of 2023. Uh, then October 1st of 2023 was the kind of overall implementation date for Inspire. 
unless an extension was given. And as we'll see on these next slides, HUD has in fact given several extensions uh, just due to the need to train up on Inspire and, and get everyone aware of what's going on. So the first extension that we have is the CPD side of HUD. So again, this is things like the Home Investment Partnerships Program, uh, National Housing Trust Fund, Community Development Block Grants, that side of HUD. Um, so this side of HUD was the first to issue an extension. Uh, so back in September uh, of last year, uh, HUD released a notice saying we need to delay for these various programs. Uh, and what HUD said was that the grantees who are running these programs, so your city who's allocating home funds, or the state that's allocating home funds, uh, they have the option to choose to delay their implementation of Inspire up to October 1st of 2024. Uh, because what HUD has told us is that they intend to give us additional written guidance, some official HUD notices that will give some more detailed information on how Inspire applies to these programs. However, HUD said that you can go ahead with the information you have and apply Inspire if you would like, as long as you make sure to, to modify in the future with anything new that comes out in that pending notice, okay? So what we have seen is a variety of things here. Some of our uh, participating jurisdiction grantees, again, those entities awarding home funds, housing trust funds, some of them have said, we're gonna go ahead and do Inspire to align with HUD multifamily and the tax credit program. Some may be delaying uh, until later in the year. So it'll be important to know uh, what your particular jurisdiction is doing on these programs. The second extension we have uh, then came about uh, about 10 days later uh, in late September of last year, uh, HUD Public and Indian Housing put out a delay, but this delay is only for the voucher program. So housing choice vouchers, project-based vouchers. This did not extend for public housing. As we mentioned, that was actually the first adopter all the way back to last July. So HUD PIH says that our public housing authorities who are administering voucher programs um, can start using um, Inspire instead of HQS as soon as October 1st of last year, uh, but that they have the option to delay until 10-1 of 24. Uh, all they had to do was notify HUD in writing of their intent to delay. Um, and HUD really did this to say, we acknowledge that not only do you have to get your staff trained, but PHAs are required to annually create what's called an HCV administrative plan that has all their policies and procedures on how they run the voucher program that has to go through public comment. It has to go to HUD for approval. And they acknowledged, look, it's going to take our PHA some time to get their administrative plans rewritten for Inspire compliance. Um, so we got this extension. So again, your particular public housing authority you're working with may already have implemented. That's allowable, but they may be waiting uh, up to another almost six months to implement Inspire. So in your jurisdiction, you need to know what your participating jurisdiction is doing, what your PHA is doing, uh, because these extensions are out there. Okay, so who is not covered by an extension? Well, as we said, public housing, Inspire is the, the law of the land as of July 1st of 2023. Um, HUD multifamily world, so our PBRA 202811 uh, HUD handbook world was effective as of 10-1-23. Um, and tax credits, really my read if you look at the regs would be that a really technically effective 10-1-23 but the reality is we know the tax credit program has a lot of um, local variables from state to state and we really are going to need to look to our state housing finance agency for what are they doing uh, the reality is as i talk to a lot of my hfa friends across the country Last year, by 10-1, most of us had completed most of our 2023 inspections for the year. Many of us just wrapped up 2023 under the old UPCS. And what we've really seen is most HFAs are making Inspire effective in 2024, commonly 1-1-24 and beyond. And that is what Indiana is doing, as we'll see here in just a moment on the Indiana-specific slide. Okay. Now, as we wrap up this section on who does this Inspire apply to, this is a very important slide, and you'll see some of this information again on the final slide because I'm going to reiterate it. Um, but the big thing that's important to know here is that generally speaking, Inspire applies to all projects. Inspire is not a new project looking forward rule. There is no grandfathered in clause, right? So UPCS and HQS, our old inspection standards, 
they are sunset. They are replaced. They are essentially dead, right? These are not, well, because I was funded 10 years ago, I still get to use them. There's no test based on what year were you allocated or awarded funds? When did you place in service? When did you get your certificate of occupancy? That doesn't matter. Inspire just comes in, says we're the new gorilla on the block and we're taking over everybody. Now, the only exception that may come is on the HUD CPD side. Again, home, National Housing Trust Fund, et cetera, side of HUD. We will get more information when HUD puts out its final notice for Inspire for CPD programs. But what HUD has indicated in its initial notices is, is that they're aware there could be a situation in which certain projects will be grandfathered into old inspection rules. Uh, and specifically, this is on the Home and National Housing Trust Fund side. And what HUD has said is, look, we realize that some of our grantees, the states or cities running these programs, got really, really specific in the award agreements or the liens that they recorded against home properties, okay? If that grantee wrote specifically into your legal award agreement or recorded a lien against your property that specifically said, we will use UPCS to monitor you, HUD has said, well, you're probably legally stuck continuing to do that because that was a binding agreement between the awarding grantee and the owner of the project, unless both parties agree to amend that document. Okay. The reality is a lot of the HUD grantees, IHCDA, for example, right? We've gone back and looked at our templates. We were never that specific. There's language in the award agreements and in the liens that say we're going to inspect you and you must comply with inspections. But the specific rules about how those inspections would happen live more in our compliance manuals and supplemental documents. But if you are, if you do have home funds and your home agreement has very specific language that you were being monitored under an old protocol, you may still continue to be monitored under that protocol, even though we're in Inspire world now. So stay tuned. There'll be more information coming from HUD on this. Uh, this probably won't come up a lot, but it is the one potential exception to Inspire that we're currently aware of. Okay, so let's go to a couple IHCDA specific slides. You'll see the state of Indiana outline at the top here. So our national friends who don't do work in Indiana will be less interested. There's only three or four slides like this in the whole presentation today. Uh, this first slide here is talking about when is IHCDA implementing Inspire to replace UPCS. So for our programs that we're using UPCS as the protocol um, for inspections, we have moved to Inspire as of January 1st, 2024. These slides are going to be posted online. Uh, we'll send them out to anyone who wants them via email as well, so I'm not going to read this full list. The reality here is this is basically all of the IHCDA capital funding programs, uh, but also our Section 811 rental assistance program. Okay, So all of these programs were previously inspected under UPCS. They've moved to Inspire, and we've changed to Inspire as of 1-1-24. Okay, now the second universe, uh, and there's some red notices there that explain this in more detail, notice 2352 and 24-06, okay, and you can find those on our website. Um, now, the other side of the world for us is our non-capital funding programs, rental assistance programs, where we were using HQS, not UPCS. Uh, these we did delay. So for IHCDA's housing choice voucher programs, including project-based vouchers and all those, quote, special purpose vouchers like VASH for homeless veterans, the NED mainstream program for non-elderly disabled persons, etc., the traditional HCV program, the special vouchers, and the project-based vouchers, uh, as well as our smaller yeah. rental assistance programs. Uh, please mute yourself if you're uh, if you're talking. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, the housing choice vouchers and the tenant-based rental assistance programs. We are waiting until 10-1-24. So those programs are still currently under HQS. We are working with our various partners on moving towards Inspire on those programs. All right. So we'll go through this part quickly. Um, this is a list of various guidance that is already out there on Inspire at the federal level. So you'll see there's a number of notices, uh, the inspection standards notice, the final standards documents. There are 63 different standards, each with its own document. Uh, very important that we understand these standards. Uh, HUD multifamily has its administrative procedures out. We're still waiting on that to come out from the CPD side. There's the scoring notice that explains how you'll be scored. Uh, all of these notices are available at that bottom link, uh, hud.gov slash program offices, uh, et cetera, as you'll see there. Um, oh, thank you. If, if you were seeing the notes view, I'm not sure. Um, 
looks like someone took over for a second. Okay, we got it back. Um, so you'll see that link there. Uh, that link, and again, you'll get these slides. That will take you to HUD's Inspire webpage where all these materials are there for download. Okay. What do we not have? Well, as we've said, we don't have the CPD notice yet from HUD on exactly how Inspire applies to Home, HTF, and the other CPD programs. Uh, they're saying there'll be two separate notices, presumably at some point this year with additional guidance. Uh, for now, those of us who have already adopted Inspire to these programs are using the existing HUD guidance. We'll adapt if they say anything contradictory in the new guidance, right? And then, as I said earlier, we don't technically have anything specific from uh, the IRS Treasury side of the world yet either. Okay, so what we do, what we know is that we used to use UPCS on the tax credit program. HUD says UPCS is going away, right? So we make the logical assumption that we need to go to Inspire on the tax credit program as well. We don't know what, if anything, the IRS will officially put out in written documents, but behind the scenes, we've heard the IRS officials through various events with the uh, state agencies tell us that, yeah, they understand that Inspire uh, is, is where we're heading, right? Now, we don't have to just make a, a true assumption. We can do a little regulatory research and, and kind of put this together to feel pretty confident about Inspire applying to the tax credit program, right? So the tax credit program, when we look at how does the program tell us, the states, how to do our file monitoring and our physical inspections? Well, that's what's often called the, the Dash 5 regulation, 142-5. Um, and in that regulation, there's a spot here that says that the agencies have to determine whether buildings and units uh, satisfy the uniform physical condition standards for public housing established at 24 CFR 5.703. Now, the Uniform Physical Condition Standards, that is the old standard, but it's not capitalized here. Um, and where we've seen the industry really say is, look, the standard used by public housing is now Inspire. And if I go to 24 CFR 5.703, that federal regulation now, UPCS is gone. That has been replaced with Inspire, right? So what we've heard from almost all the industry, everyone's in agreement saying, yep, if I look at this regulation now, the cross-reference is there. The tax credit program needs to follow Inspire. All right, so we've laid the background of who does Inspire apply to, when does it apply, both nationally and in the state of Indiana. So now we go on and say, well, let's look at uh, what Inspire means, right? So the first thing to focus on here is that Inspire does have just a bit of a different overall focus on what it cares about and what it doesn't care about, okay? So when we think about the old world of UPCS and HQS, we were often always taught that old mantra of decent, safe, sanitary uh, housing, right? Decent, safe safe and sanitary in good repair. Um, Inspire slightly changes that saying, and now the saying is functionally adequate, operable, and free of health and safety hazards. Now that doesn't quite flow off the tongue like de decent, safe, and sanitary, but what we see here is there is a, a specific focus on does the unit or building function, does it do what it was supposed to do, and is it healthy and safe? And that truly is Inspire's focus, right? Is a building or a unit functional? Is it safe? Is it healthy? That priority of moving towards health, safety, and functionality gets us away from some of the HQS and UPCS focus that was on cosmetic issues and the way tenants took care of their property, right? So for a few examples, this is just a couple examples I like to give. There are others, right? Some things that would have maybe been an inspection fail in our old world, Inspire doesn't care about. So for example, how many times have you been written up under an old system because the property has overgrown vegetation? Inspire says if that vegetation is not a tripping or physical accessibility hazard, we don't care that there's weeds on the property, right? Doesn't have anything to do with functionality, safety, or health, okay? Holes, dents, dings in walls or wherever, if they do not pose a safety or functional issue, right? Minor holes that aren't an issue, they don't look great. Maybe it's not good for marketability, uh, but it's not an Inspire fail issue. Um, and then another one, tenant possessions blocking egress, right? You have to meet certain egress requirements for safety, but if you built it to egress requirements, you can't control that that tenant stacked 700 boxes of their personal stuff in front of the window, 
Inspire would say the tenant sh shouldn't do that. It's not good for their safety, but that's outside your control. It's not the condition of the building or the unit itself. You're not getting a, an inspection fail because of the way the tenant has stacked their furnishing or belongings. Okay. So again, looking more less at cosmetic and housekeeping issues, more at the true functionality and safety of the building. Okay, so in Inspire, we have three inspectable areas to look at. Um, under old systems, UPCS in particular had five. They're kind of condensed down into three now. So we're concerned about the unit itself, where the household lives, everything else inside the building. So all the common areas, hallways, leasing areas, et cetera. And then the outside, which used to be kind of a couple different areas, but this is the outside of the building, plus the grounds, parking lots, walkways, et cetera. So three inspectable areas. And what's important under uh, Inspire is that each of these inspectable areas not only has, oh, if I see a problem, I have to write it up, but the inspector also has a specific list of what is called affirmative habitability requirements. These are things I must look for and confirm in my inspection that they are there and they are in working order. OK, so let's go through these one by one. The unit, pretty self-explanatory. This is where the resident lives, everything behind their individual door, right? Under the unit, we have a number of affirmative habitability requirements, OK? We're going to run through these. Most of them are pretty self-explanatory, but there are a few that may jump out as new to you, right? Oh, we didn't used to have to have this. First, we have to have hot and cold running water in the bathroom and the kitchen, including some source of safe drinking water. Pretty self-explanatory should have already been in effect. OK, every unit has to have a bathroom or sanitary facility that is in proper working order that has a usable sink, usable tub or shower and a toilet that can flush. Pretty simple. OK, now this is one where we start to get into more detail than maybe we used to have. This will come up again later in the training. Smoke detectors. We have to have at least one smoke detector in all of these locations. At least one on every level of the unit, if it's a multi-level unit. At least one inside each bedroom. One within 21 feet of any door to a bedroom along a path of travel. And if we have put a smoke detector outside of a bedroom, and it is separated from the living room by a door, we need to make sure there's also a smoke detector on the living room side of that door. OK, so these are requirements. This is every one of these places. We have to have a smoke detector in every unit. It's not just now, you know, a total number of unit of smoke detectors or I push it and does it turn on, but an Inspire inspector is going to be determining that smoke detectors are in all of these locations. Spoiler alert, when we get to our list later of the three most common issues we have found under Inspire through the first three months of doing these inspections, smoke detectors placement is number one. OK, so a lot of properties that maybe were un in compliance under old standards are failing the Inspire standards based on where Inspire tells us smoke detectors have to be. OK, number four, we have to have a living room and a kitchen with a sink, cooking appliance, fridge, food prep, and food storage areas. So every unit needs these things. Uh, if the unit is a voucher unit, there needs to be at least one bedroom or sleeping area for every two people in the household. We have to meet certain carbon monoxide detection standards, which may get updated over time through the Federal Register. HUD warns us here that these rules may continue to change. Uh, we'll talk more about carbon monoxide detection later. This is also one of the most common issues we're seeing so far. OK, uh, every unit uh, needs to have at least two working outlets or one working outlet and a permanent light in every habitable room. So each of our habitable rooms, either two outlets or one outlet and a, and a permanent light, most likely a ceiling light uh, installed in the room. Another common issue, this is one that we're seeing that maybe people were not in compliance are not in compliance with because it didn't used to be required. GFCI outlet protection, uh, ground fault circuit interruption is very important in Inspire and is a big common issue so far. So what Inspire says, we'll look at some exceptions later, but the general rule is any outlet within six feet of a water source must be a GFCI outlet. Uh, this is another common issue we're seeing right now uh, due to the new focus on this through Inspire. 
Uh, ninth requirement for units, uh, if you're in a climate zone designated by HUD, uh, Indiana is in that climate zone, uh, you must have a permanently installed heating source in every unit, and that heating source cannot be unvented space heaters that burn gas, oil, or kerosene. Okay, We are a heating state, so every unit needs permanent heating sources. Uh, this is another one we've seen some properties say, oops, we didn't have this before. Um, you have to have a guardrail anywhere in the unit where there is an elevated walking surface that drops more than 30 inches vertically. So handrails within the units, you'll see this comes up later in the exterior areas as well. And then our kitchens and our bathrooms must have permanently installed light fixtures. Okay, not the bedrooms, but the kitchens and the bathrooms have to have that. Those 11 things, every time an inspector goes into a unit, they need to affirm those 11 things are in order. After they do that, they may also start noting other issues, right? Like, oh, there's a crack in the window, there's some mold, whatever. They're still going to observe deficiencies they happen to see, but the inspector is first saying this 11 things in the unit, are they all there? Okay, kind of a change in the inspection process. Now we move from the interior of the individual's unit now out into the building as a whole, where we get into things like the common areas, the leasing areas, uh, utility rooms, mechanical rooms, the basement, you know, et cetera, all those other areas in the building. And here there are six habitability requirements. They are going to be very similar to what we've already seen. Okay. Um, each level of the building needs to have at least one smoke detector. Uh, we need to meet the carbon monoxide detection standards. Our outlets in these areas also have to be GFCI if within six feet of a water source. If there's a 30 inch vertical drop, we have to have guardrails. All of our common area kitchens and, bat and bathrooms have to have permanent mounted light fixtures and we can't have uh, unvented space heaters in the building, okay? So all of these six items we already saw under the 11 items in the unit, but they also apply in our common areas uh, within the building. And then finally, the last inspectable area is the outside. So again, the exterior of the building plus the grounds. Um, so this looks at systems that are outside, fencing, parking lot, lighting, the roof, you know, everything, okay? Three, two affirmative things here. Again, we've already seen these twice now, but they show up here on the outside too. If we have outside outlets within six feet of a water source, they must be GFCI. And any go anywhere where there's a 30 inch vertical drop, we must have guardrails, okay? So really, when we think about this, there were 11 standards in the unit. Those are the 11 standards we have to memorize. And then we know that some of those also carry out into the common areas and the outside of the building, okay? These are what our inspectors are looking for. And when we show, again, the three most common issues we're seeing right now, three, all three of them are related to these affirmative habitability requirements. All right, so the inspectors come out, has done the inspection, and is going to write an inspection report under Inspire. And under Inspire, they are going to assign every issue that they find is going to get one of four severity levels. The nice thing with Inspire, is that it is not inspector discretion or choice. So it should not depend on, oh, I got the harder inspector and the property down the street got the easier inspector this week, right? Every inspector, when they look at the Inspire standard, it tells you, you must assign this severity level and you give them this many days to resolve it. There's no discretion there. So if you find a life-threatening issue, right? This is uh, presents a high risk of death to a resident, that is a 24 hour correction period. The inspector is required under Inspire to notify the owner agent of that deficiency before they leave the inspection, right? You're still gonna get my full inspection report tomorrow, later this week, whatever, but I am required under Inspire to notify you right now before I leave. Here are your life-threatening issues. Your clock starts now, you have 24 hours to correct, okay? The second level of a deficiency would be a severe issue. So HUD, HUD says a severe issue has a high likelihood of causing risk of disability, serious injury, or illness. So maybe not all the way to death, but it's still very bad for the health and safety of the household. Uh, in most of our programs, this is also a 24-hour correction. You would be notified immediately before the inspector leaves. The exception here is in the, in the tenant-based housing choice voucher program. 
if I am doing an inspection um, and I find this, my my uh, owner gets 30 days to correct. And this is really acknowledging that a lot of times uh, our our owners in the HCD program might be smaller mom and pops. They're, they're project might not be funded with federal dollars. They've just agreed to house our voucher holders. So HUD is a little more lenient with giving them more time to correct something than they are with our, you know, tax credit funded, HUD funded properties. Okay. So HCV would get 30 days to correct a severe issue. Next level down would be a moderate issue. Um, so it's a problem, but but not going to imminently cause injury or death uh, across all programs. This is a 30 day correction period. And then finally, we get to low. Um, HUD says this is still an issue related to the habitability of the unit, but we don't think it's actually a health risk. In most programs, the owner has 60 days to correct it. In the tenant-based housing choice voucher program, the inspector actually will just go ahead and pass. They won't even, they might note this as an observation, like it would be great to fix it, but a fix is not required to pass the HCV inspection. So that's important for our PHA friends and those who are administering HCV programs to understand the severity levels do apply a little differently for the voucher program. All right. I'm not going through all these. This is just to show you there are a wide variety of things that, that are classified as life threatening risk of death, 24 hours to fix carbon monoxide issues with a chimney uh, entry doors are missing egress is blocked uh, electrical issues missing fire extinguishers exit signs guardrails uh, serious issues with the hvac system not working uh, oil or gas leaks mold smoke alarms missing etc a large number of issues are categorized as life-threatening okay now you may say um you know is it really life-threatening if a toilet is missing um hud says that's a that's a severe issue we don't care if you don't think someone's going to die without a toilet it, it still is on there right so some of these might not be something on first pass you think that means someone's going to die when you go back to that definition nevertheless all of these items on these last three slides and you can find these all listed in the hud notice um, these are the things that would be life-threatening now in the voucher program, what's interesting, this is the red note at the bottom, uh, the HUD notice from, from the public and Indian housing side says that the public housing authority running the voucher program has the discretion in their admins plan to say in their jurisdiction, they can define other things as life-threatening for the HCV program. So if you are a PHA that wants to be stricter and require a 24 hour correction on your HCV landlords and owners, if you put it in your admin plan and it gets approved by HUD, you can broaden your list of life-threatening issues. Right now, that only applies to the HCV program. All of our other programs would use the standard list. HCV can't detract, can't take away from this list, but can add to it, okay? All right. So under Inspire, if you are someone who does maintenance, asset management, uh, inspections, there are 63 different standards that you're going to need to kind of familiarize yourself with. Um, and each of these has its own PDF document on HUD's website, right? So if I said, um, oh, what do I need to know about Windows, right? These are all alphabetical. Uh, Windows is the last one. It's in Sp Inspire standard number 63. I could pull that document and that document is going to tell me what a window is for every one of these it's going to define what that item is so what is a window why is a window important then it's going to tell you everything that could go wrong with a window and if that has gone wrong what level of severity you should assign and how many days the owner has to correct it so these standards are very prescriptive um, and should move us into a system where again doesn't matter if matt was your inspector or joe was your inspector um, you should have the same um, severity ranking the same correction identified etc because they're all defined in the standards so obviously, if we were going to go through all 63 standards, we'd be here for days. Um, we have links for you to all of those standards. What we want to do now is we're going to look at four of these 63 standards. We're going to look at three that are the most common issues we've seen so far. And one bonus topic I've picked just because it's kind of uh, newer information that it's important for people to know. All right. 
So as I said, IHCDA for all of its capital funded programs and its 811 program went to Inspire as of 1124. So we have a quarter worth of inspections under our belt. Uh, our inspectors have been out doing this work uh, and have been communicating with me frequently on what are we seeing and, and where is Inspire working and not working, right? We are seeing a very clear trend on three common issues in this order. The first is either the placement or a lack of smoke alarms. So they're not in the right place or they're missing. Okay. Second, the placement or a lack of carbon monoxide alarms. And then third, that the GFCI outlets are not GFCI or are inoperable uh, and they are required to be GFCI under Inspire. As I said earlier, these are affirmative habitability requirements, right? These are that new list of things the inspector must confirm are in place in every unit. And also smoke alarms, carbon monoxide, and GFCI also apply in the interior building, and GFCI also applies on the exterior, okay? So these affirmative habitability requirements are the big issues we're finding. So let's look in detail at each of these. What are the issues? How do you try to resolve them? Okay, so smoke alarm standards. Uh, this is again one of the 63 standards under Inspire. And HUD tells us there are three possible deficiencies related to smoke alarms. The first would be there's some place I was supposed to install one and I did not. Okay, the blue box here is just repeat. I'm not going to go through it again. That is the affirmative habitability requirement that says a smoke detector must be in all of these locations. Okay, so I didn't put it where I was supposed to put it. Option two. The deficiency it's obstructed it got painted over something's a bags over it hanging over whatever it may be um or number three the inspector pokes the button and an alarm does not go off okay these would be uh, the possible deficiencies under inspire the important thing to know is that any of these deficiencies, they are all classified as light threatening. You're gonna have a 24 hour correction period. And while we're not talking about scoring today, the reality is the way the scoring has been reworked, life threatening is going to score more severely. Um, so if you have smoke detector issues, your score is gonna get worse. You're gonna be rated as a higher risk property and subject to more frequent uh, inspections, okay? So the important thing to know with smoke alarms is not only where do I put them? We talked about that earlier. Here's every location you need a smoke alarm, but Inspire gets even more prescriptive and says, once I've determined I need a smoke alarm in this bedroom and this hallway and this living room, right? These are the three places I need a smoke alarm. I then have specific rules on how I hang that smoke alarm. So these are also some of the issues we're seeing, okay? So, HUD says a smoke alarm needs to be installed high on the wall or ceiling. If it is on the ceiling, it must be greater than four inches away from the wall. If it is on the wall, the top edge of the alarm must be, uh, cannot be closer than four inches to the ceiling, nor farther than 12 inches away from the ceiling. So I've got this sweet spot, four to 12 inches down from the ceiling is where I have to hang my smoke detector on the wall, okay? Um, I can't put a smoke alarm within 10 feet of a cooking appliance, and I also should not put it near, there's not a clear definition, but it cannot be near windows, doors, or ducts where drafts might interfere with their operation, okay? So what we have seen, the first type of fail we're seeing is Inspire says, I have to have a smoke alarm in all these locations. There's no smoke alarm there at all. The secondary issue we're seeing is, hey, great, you put a smoke alarm in that room, but it's hung on the wrong spot on the ceiling, wrong spot on the wall, et cetera. Our inspector has to write that up as well. So if you're an inspector, the reality is part of your testing is a visual test. Is it in the right spot? I've done the affirmative habitability check. Now I also have to push the button to see if the alarm goes off. And I'm going to have to pull out my measuring stick and say, is it the right number of inches away from the ceiling and from the wall, enough feet away from a cooking appliance, et cetera, right? So this is a complicated rule, and this is where we're seeing the most fails, okay? So I would recommend, if you've not yet had an Inspire inspection, get ahead of this. Do a self-inspection of your units and see if your uh, alarms are in the right spots, okay? Second most common issue we are seeing so far is carbon monoxide alarms, okay? Very similar to smoke detectors. The three issues are it's not there, it's obstructed, or I poke the button and nothing happens, okay? Any of these is a life-threatening issue with a 24-hour correction. Now, the important thing here is that Inspire itself does not always mandate that every unit or every building has to have carbon monoxide detectors. 
your local jurisdiction, another funder may tell you we always want carbon monoxide detection. So be it. Inspire, though, says we only have to have carbon monoxide alarms in one of four situations. If the unit or the building contains fuel burning appliances or fireplaces, OK? If I have if my bedroom or my bathroom is attached to a bedroom with a fuel burning appliance or has an adjacent space where the byproducts of combustion gas can flow, right? This gets complicated, but essentially, right, there's some type of fuel burning appliances uh, or systems in the unit or somewhere in the building where gases are flowing, okay? Third, if the unit or the bedroom is served by a forced air furnace that is located somewhere else in the building, or fourth, if my unit or bedroom is located one story or less above or below an attached garage, and it is deemed that that garage does not have sufficient natural ventilation for the exhaust and the vehicle fumes to get out of the garage. OK, this is a high level summary. I have a red note here, right? This is complicated. This is one of those standards you really need to review closely. Read this whole, you know, several pages of, of HUD instruction on carbon monoxide detection to see if it applies to your property. If it applies, if you have a unit or a building that is required to have carbon monoxide alarms because it has one of these requirements in place, then what HUD tells us is we need a CO detector in each bedroom or in the immediate vicinity of each bedroom. OK, so the issues we might be seeing is our inspector says, well, you meet one of these standards and you don't have any alarms. That's a problem. Or you meet these standards. You only have one alarm, but it's a three bedroom unit, right? I'm depending on the configuration. I might need multiple alarms so that I meet that standard of in each bedroom or immediate vicinity of each bedroom. It's a little gray, right? What's the immediate vicinity? These are things eventually we probably expect to see more HUD guidance, right? When we go back to the affirmative habitability requirements, HUD already warned us, you have to meet the carbon monoxide detection standards as established through federal register notices. Likely more guidance is coming here. And last but not least, the third most common issue we're seeing on inspections is GFCI or AFCI protected outlets. As we said earlier, both the interior, exterior, and in-unit affirmative habitability requirements tell us if the outlet is within six feet of a water source, it must be GFCI or AFCI protected. Um, and so the issue would be that either the outlet is not a GFCI or AFCI or I push the button to try to trip it and make sure that that outlet protection is working and it doesn't do anything. OK, so our inspector is both looking visually. Are these outlets there? And then they're tripping them to see if they, they are functioning correctly. Now, I mentioned earlier, the general rule for affirmative habitability is every outlet within six feet of a water source. But we have a couple of exceptions. OK, so there are two exceptions to this rule. If an outlet is within six feet of a water source, it needs to be GFCI protected unless our exception one is if it is an outlet that is dedicated to a major appliance, right? So we can envision there's an outlet that is designed to only serve our water heater, our HVAC system, the washer dryer, et cetera, okay? So HUD says a dedicated outlet is a receptacle outlet that is only capable of serving that specific appliance. There aren't other plugs. I can't use it for other purposes. In that case, it does not have to be GFCI. That's a, it's already a dedicated, specially designed outlet, okay? The other option would be if our outlet is below a countertop, this would probably be in the kitchen or bathroom, right? If it's below a countertop, and enclosed within a cabinet, then regardless of its distance from water, we don't have to protect it because presumably both the uh, countertop and the door that it's behind are going to keep water out of that outlet. OK, so these are our two exceptions. Any other outlets, any other situation within six feet of a water source, we have to protect. Now, the important thing to note, right, because you're thinking of your outside outlets, the fact that you are outside and rain could happen, that does not mean a water source, right? The sky is not considered a water source itself. We'd be talking about, you know, faucets, you know, other things that are, are actual water sources where, where water would be expected to come, okay? All right, 
Bonus topic. This is not one of the top three issues we've seen so far, but this is an issue we've seen, seen some questions on and where I think Inspire has really given us much more um, firm information than we had before. Because reality under UPCS and HQS, sometimes it was a pretty gray area. What do we do when there are infestation issues in a project? Um, is it actually a UPCS or HQS issue? Or do we just say, well, it's a local health code issue. Maybe the health department needs to be involved. What role should the inspector have, right? Inspire really defines this much more and says that yes, infestation is a health safety habitability issue. It should absolutely be marked as an issue uh, and not just as an observation, but as an issue that requires corrective action from an owner agent. Okay. Interestingly, what HUD does is they say that there's not one standard definition of an infestation. Um, depending on what the infestation is, we have different correction periods. Okay. So certain things are moderate. Uh, if there is evidence of uh, cockroaches, in individual cockroaches, or an infestation of cockroaches, HUD says moderate, moderate issue, okay? Uh, bed bugs, a couple bed bugs would be moderate, an infestation of bed bugs, severe. That's a 24-hour correction, right? Uh, we see signs of one mouse, moderate, a mouse infestation, severe, 24 hours to get that corrected. Same thing with rats, one moderate infestation, multiple severe. Uh, other pests, squirrels, bats, birds, wasps, bees, reptiles generally fall under a moderate category, okay? So if the inspector sees signs of infestation, they're trying to determine, does it look like one solitary creature or is there an infestation of multiple? What type of creature does it seem to be? And they've got to look at these HUD charts and determine what level of severity that rises up to, okay? now. There has to be evidence. It could be that the inspector sees that that plump mouse running across the kitchen cabinet with a piece of cheese in its mouth, right? That's possible, but it doesn't have to be that obvious. So evidence could be a number of things. It could in fact be the live or dead animal. It could be droppings. It could be urine trails. It could be chew signs, right? I see chewed up boxes in the kitchen. Um, I see, um, sorry, urine trails repeated twice here. Uh, eggs, egg casings, shed skin, blood trails, anything that indicates to the inspector that a creature is, has been here could be evidence, right? It doesn't have to be, I see the creature scurrying across the floor. Okay, again, this is important because this was a grayer area pre-inspire, but now we know it absolutely is an inspection issue. And in many cases, uh, it, it could be a severe issue that requires a 24 hour correction period, okay? So it's important more so than ever perhaps to make sure our owner agents are doing proper treatment, uh, preventing infestations because to, to get rid of an infestation within 24 hours is probably gonna be a difficult correction, okay? All right, so we've made it through the common issues. So that was four out of 63 standards. Uh, obviously, it's it's incumbent upon all of you to continue researching Inspire, get further training, read through those standards as your time permits. So as we work towards wrapping up, I wanna hit a few other kind of miscellaneous Inspire topics. Uh, first is thinking about, um, you know, if you get an Inspire inspection or if you are an inspector, what would you in expect an Inspire report to look like, okay? So what we learn in Inspire is that our inspector should identify the issue as follows, right? What building did it occur in? What was the area? So we have three inspectable areas. Which of the 63 standards was violated? What is the specific deficiency, the specific location? Which four rankings of our health and safety determination is applicable? No discretion there. We've got to do what HUD tells us. And then how long is the correction period? Again, based on what HUD tells us, not the inspector's personal feelings. So that would look something like this, right? The inspector would say, I was in building one. The area was in a unit the standard was the grab bar standard. The deficiency, the grab bar isn't secure. Uh, that location was unit 101. HUD tells me an insecure grab bar is a moderate health and safety risk. A moderate health and safety risk is a 30 day correction period, right? So this is essentially not necessarily this format, but this content is what an Inspire inspector should be writing up for every individual issue they find using this kind of format, okay? So now you, many of you on the call, not all represent owner agents, either the owner or the management company. Um, so what is your responsibility on all this? What are some recommended next steps? Well, first of all, it's important to note, if you are running a public housing or a HUD multifamily project, again, HUD multifamily is Section 8 PBRA, HUD 202, HUD 811, PRACS, all those HUD handbook programs, right? 
Um, if you are running one of these projects, the owner agent, or in the case of public housing, the PHA that, that runs that public housing is required to conduct a self-inspection of every unit in all the projects, at least annually. And the point of that inspection is you are expected to confirm that the affirmative habitability requirements and inspire standards have been met. OK, so you can't just say, well, I'll wait for a third party inspector to come out and tell me if I did something wrong in public housing and HUD multifamily world. You are legally obligated now to do a self inspection on your own every year. Your staff need to know that affirmative habitability checklist, and this is 100 percent of the units. If you identify your own issue, you are still required to correct it in the normal time. So you find your own life threatening issue. You have to give yourself 24 hours to correct it. You must maintain copies of proof you did these inspections and self-corrected. You have to keep all of those reports for a three-year period. HUD can ask for proof you've been doing this and corrected your issues. And if you go to the HUD Public and Housing Notice 2023-16 or Housing 2023-07, these are the same notice just with two different numbers, that tells you all the requirements on self-inspections. Now for everyone else, tax credit owners, home, et cetera, uh, a self-inspection is certainly recommended so that you're aware of what's going on at your property, but not required. Um, however, we would strongly recommend that you do it upfront now, right? We have moved into Inspire World. It is, it is really incumbent on you to understand, are you Inspire compliant, right? Especially go into your portfolio now, would I meet the carbon monoxide, the fire alarm, uh, and the GFCI tests, right? Those are the three most common things we're failing on a vast majority of inspections. Do your own self-inspection, get out ahead of this and get these issues fixed, right? All right, now the elephant in the room here is that some of these things may cost, right? You don't have GFCI outlets in place. Uh, you, you have half as many carbon monoxide detectors or smoke detectors as you're now required based on affirmative habitability requirements, or you've got to go in and rehang them all because they're all too close to the ceiling or the wall. Um, that's going to take work. You're paying for labor. You may be buying new materials, et cetera. Um, but there are no dedicated funds from HUD, from the Housing Finance Authority, et cetera, that's going to say, hey, here's a special pot of money. Oh, you need Inspire repairs. Dip into this funds, right? It's on you. Some people will say, that's not fair. We didn't know these standards were coming. We've been in compliance. Why aren't we grandfathered? Why don't we have a farther ramp up time? It is what it is, right? These are the rules. This is what has gone into effect. So if you are having to make repairs to get into compliance with Inspire, right, this is possibly a use of some replacement reserves you have, uh, reserves on the property, excess cash flow you have available, et cetera. Uh, ultimately, right, you may need to talk to your investor, your lender, other relevant funders or parties, whoever controls these reserve or cash flow funds, uh, but you're going to need to find funding to make these repairs. And a lack of dedicated funding is not an excuse for non-compliance, right? So you're out of compliance with Inspire, you had a 30 day correction period, you didn't correct it. A response back to HUD or the HFA saying, well, we don't have the funds to make those repairs is not gonna get you a lot of grace, right? You, you've gotta get these things fixed because Inspire, the response is gonna be Inspire identified health and safety issues and we have to prioritize the health and safety of our tenants. All right, we're almost done in perfect timing as we wrap up with a few final reminders, okay? Uh, first, Passing an Inspire inspection does not mean that you're going to pass other inspections, right? This is not local building code. It's not the International Fire Code. Other things your funders expect, you committed to your tax credit agency, you do all these cool special features under the QAP, Fair Housing Accessibility 504, right? Passing Inspire is not an argument later to another funder or other inspector to say, well, what do you mean I'm out of compliance, right? Different inspectors are looking for different things and vice versa, right? So an Inspire inspector comes out and you say, well, the city gave me my certificate of occupancy, or I just passed uh, a few years ago, I passed a UPCS inspection, right? It doesn't matter. One is not a guarantee you will pass the other. This is a special inspection for certain purposes. It is different than UPCS and HQS. Doesn't matter if you passed those in the past, we have to move on and understand that Inspire is now the rule in effect. And then finally, we've said it once before, but I said I would reiterate it, right? Inspire is generally applicable to all projects now without grandfathering in. We don't care that you were funded 20 years ago, what QAP you were funded under, what year you placed in service, got your certificate of occupancy. We are all moving into this world uh, and Inspire applies. We have seen a number of owner agents contesting their inspection results this year saying, oh, Inspire doesn't apply to me. I'm an older project. 
and we have to go back and say, I'm sorry it does. Here's the HUD notices, right? So just, just get past that idea, get ahead of the ball, self-inspect now, identify issues, identify those available funds on the property to start making corrections uh, and bring yourself Inspire compliant. So here are a couple of resources for you. IHCDA's compliance webpage does have a new Inspire section with uh, our Inspire notices. We also link to the HUD materials here. We, we have a zip folder with all of the 63 inspection standards. Uh, this training recording and slides will also go up on this website in the next few days. And then there's the link to all of HUD's notices across all of its programs. Uh, please download these materials. Make sure your team is aware of Inspire requirements. And with that, right on time, we have covered the 101 to Inspire. That is my direct contact information, email and phone number. Please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, I'll answer anything I can. I'll loop in our inspectors as needed to address uh, more technical items, uh, but we're happy to help you think through getting your properties Inspire compliant. Um, and with that, we are at time. Understand many of you may be jumping off, but for those who want to stick around, I'll be happy to do uh, a little Q&A uh, until there's no more questions. So uh, feel free to put a question in the chat or to unmute yourself and ask a question. Okay, not seeing any questions in the chat. I know this is a pretty dense topic. Um, we will go ahead and look to adjourn here. Amanda, anything else you wanted to share from the Affordable Housing Association? Um, no, I don't think so. I put our contact information in the chat and I just wanna say thank you to you. This was a very helpful presentation. Excellent. Yeah. So someone said, will this webinar be a red notice? Um, the, the webinar was recorded. We will get the recording video as well as the slides on IHCDA's compliance webpage in the Inspire section. There's a whole Inspire header on there now. Um, and the Affordable Housing Association is also welcome to post this on their website and to share it with their members. Um, and then, yeah, feel free to share it with others. This is all uh, public information. We want everyone to get the training. So distribute the video, distribute the slides. Awesome. All right, well, thanks again, everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the recording and thank you again for those who want more training. Uh, we'll see many of you again on May 6th uh, for the HOTMA training with Affordable Housing Association and IHCDA. So take care, everyone.